Today's case shows how easy it is to ruin one's life by getting involved in inappropriate relationships. And this ruined life applies in this case to everyone involved. William Douglas is a prominent scientist and a settled father of a family. He is considered a successful man and feels that way too. He is fully satisfied with his life and often calls himself a lucky man. However, a certain event causes the professor's priorities to completely change, and he begins, in secret from everyone, to do things that would have been unthinkable for him before. Gradually, the well-known professor pushes these boundaries even further. William Douglas, 40, is a professor and works at Tufts University, located near Boston, Massachusetts. Tufts is a small university, but one that enjoys very high prestige. William Douglas is an outstanding scientist. He runs a laboratory in the biology department, and his specialty is cell biology. William, who uses the name Bill exclusively in everyday life, is called the jewel of the department by his colleagues, as he obtains an exceptional number of research grants for the department. Thus, at the university, everyone appreciates him for both his professionalism and efficiency. Of course, this comes at a not inconsiderable cost. Bill works a lot. He shows up at the lab every day before 6 a.m. and usually leaves work after 7 p.m. If the professor is not in the lab, he is somewhere on the road as he often travels to meetings and conferences, including to universities in other cities. Despite this, Bill has a successful family life. His wife Nancy does not work and takes care of raising their three children and all household duties. The couple live in Sharon, located near Boston. They have a very nice house with a garden and lead a quiet, orderly life. Their relationship is considered happy. Bill and Nancy also feel that way about each other. They have been together forever. They met while they were still in college, and each of them is still the other's first and only partner. The professor earns reasonably well, but the expenses are considerable. So Nancy, who is a certified nurse by training, decides to think about whether to return to work. There is another reason. Taking care of growing children no longer consumes as much energy as before, and 40-year-old Nancy is simply beginning to miss her own professional life. It's mid-1981 when the woman gets hired at a nursing home. She works there exclusively at night, so she and Bill spend even less time together than before. For when Bill comes home, Nancy leaves the house. Nevertheless, they are happy to spend the remaining short moments together, and their family life functions perfectly. However, it only lasts until one day, for then, and coincidence changes everything. In November, the university authorities organize a special banquet for Bill, as they want to celebrate the fact that thanks to him, the department has received a particularly attractive grant. The party drags on, Bill finds that he won't be able to catch the last return train, so he decides not to go home for the night. He doesn't want to sleep and goes for a walk around the city. His college building borders the combat zone, Boston's red light district. That's where Bill goes. He eventually enters one of the bars. As he sips his drink, a young, attractive woman sits down next to him. Bill is intimidated, but the conversation moves smoothly. The man is impressed by the personal charm and intelligence of his new companion, and the affection is, it seems, mutual. The woman's name is Robin, she's 20 years old, interested in graphic design and drawing, and can talk about it in an interesting way. Her beauty is natural, and Robin is also not wearing a provocative outfit. So Bill is all the more surprised when a new acquaintance offers him an hour-long meeting at her place for the price of $100. This is quite a large amount for him. However, the man agrees and goes with Robin to her apartment. Bill returns home in the morning. He explains to his wife that the last evening train was missed and he had to spend the night in the laboratory. Only the first part of the statement is true, of course, but his wife has no suspicions. Bill can't stop thinking about the past night. The man feels that what he experienced with Robin exceeds anything he has known before. He suddenly comes to the conclusion that he had an extremely poor sex life with Nancy. And now he feels as if a world of completely new sensations has opened up to him. 
The professor begins to visit Robin regularly. At first, these meetings take place once a week and last an hour or two. Later, they are longer, and their frequency increases to several times a week. And sometime later, they take place almost every day. For every hour they spend together, Bill pays the woman her regular rate, $100, regardless of whether they spend that time in bed or on a walk. Sometimes Bill spends up to 10 hours with Robin. They often go to the movies, to the park, go kayaking. Sometimes they spend evenings at her house. Robin then prepares dinner, and Bill feels as if he is visiting his girlfriend. He is happy, and almost from the beginning he realizes that his fascination is not only related to the sexual sphere. At the same time, he still finds it hard to believe that this delicate and modestly dressed young woman earns money as a call girl. In a way, Bill is fooling himself because he sees Robin as his girlfriend, even though she meticulously accounts for every hour they spend together. This is a kind of strategy on his part. When Bill pays, he tells himself, as it were, that he is simply giving Robin the money she needs to live. And who knows, maybe later they will be together. Maybe it is actually their joint money. On top of these carefully billed hours are charges for restaurants, excursions, and even shopping, as well as the cost of gifts that Bill buys for Robin. All this results in the professor spending $16,000 on this acquaintance in the first six weeks. These are not expenses he can afford. On the contrary, Bill gets rid of all his savings and maxes out his credit cards. His wife does day-to-day -day shopping with her own money, so she doesn't notice anything for the time being. What also escapes Nancy's attention is her husband's exceptional busy schedule, as well as the fact that he has rarely been home lately. Bill, moreover, explains himself by preparing a new project while his wife herself is heavily occupied with her own work. Several months pass. By March, Bill's financial possibilities are at their limit. However, he can't imagine stopping his meetings with Robin, so he successively implements several ideas that he had already considered. First of all, he is starting to regularly add minor expenses to those incurred by his laboratory on an ongoing basis. Since this requires providing confirmations of what he spent the money on, Bill complies, so bills for cabs that he uses to commute to Robin's apartment, bills for dinners at local establishments, as well as accounts for other, even very minor expenses, go to the university's accounting department if their categorization is vague enough not to arouse suspicion in accounting. Within another pool of departmental expenses, Bill accounts for fictitious business trips. He can't do this very often, but the amounts are already sizable. The professor inflates all possible costs in the process. The most radical move, however, is Robin's employment at the lab. Naturally, it is fictitious. Only the personal details of the new and capable intern are real, whose high qualifications Bill personally attests to, confirming that she is studying at the prestigious MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and has previously pursued an internship at another lab. Bill's lab frequently hires interns, but the awarding of a certain Robin Benedict a salary of $1,000 a month, an amount twice as high as the average, draws the attention of Bill's secretary. However, she leaves this fact unmentioned and temporarily forgets about it. The infatuated professor does not even guess the existence of a rival, because his beloved has a guardian. The young man's name is Sam, and it was he who, having met Robin several years ago at a party, persuaded her to drop out of school. Coming from an ordinary family, Robin was indeed artistically gifted and dreamed of making a career in this field in the future. When she met Sam, she was a student at the rather prestigious Rhode Island School of Design Art School. But with the help of her boyfriend, she got a taste of the luxurious life which she thoroughly enjoyed. Sam persuaded her to drop out of school and pursue something more lucrative, so they could both accumulate a larger sum for their future life together. The young man got her a job at a massage parlor. Robin agreed to it, and after a short time, she also accepted that she had to perform additional services in addition to massage. 
Later, she moved to a bar, and shortly after that, she met Bill there. Meetings with the professor are a real vein of gold for Robin and Sam. They can now think about putting money aside for a house. Their relationship is peculiar, but both are actually together and plan a future together. More months pass, the summer passes. The university is slowly preparing for the new semester and clouds begin to gather over the head of Professor Bill Douglas. His subordinate laboratory staff detect inconsistencies in expense accounts. They finally turn to Jane, Bill's secretary, about it. The woman says that she herself is concerned because she has obviously noticed the professor's strange spending, but her questions on the matter are always ignored by him. Everyone, by the way, agrees that the professor has been neglecting his duties for a long time. He doesn't meet with students, colleagues, university partners. He doesn't actually have time for anything. In this conversation, it comes to light that so far, none of the employees have ever yet seen the new intern who has been employed for many months. One of the technicians shows a receipt with several small amounts on it, described by the professor as expenses for containers for collecting biological fluids. The technician, however, points to the lower part of the sheet, where there is a company imprint in small letters with the well-known brand name of condoms. This conversation results in the secretary taking action. The woman calls one of the hotels where Professor Douglas and his assistant are said to have recently stayed. When she gives the names and dates of their stay, it turns out that no such person has checked into that hotel at the time, while the actual price of the room per night is twice as low as that stated on the bill. Immediately after this conversation, the secretary reports the detected irregularities to the university authorities. A few days later, the university announces to Professor Douglas that it intends to audit his spending. Although concerned, Bill thinks he'll get away with it. After all, everyone knows how much money his grants have brought to the department. He doesn't give up his meetings with Robin, although they are less frequent and shorter, as Bill is now suffering from a chronic lack of cash. The man does not even suspect that the situation at home has changed as well. Nancy has been very vigilant for some time. Although she has not yet discovered that her husband has spent all his savings and has become heavily overdrawn in several banks, she has noticed an increase in limits and a large number of strange expenses on his credit card reports. She watches her husband closely and tries to get a sense of what's going on. One day in November, Bill is summoned to the office of one of the directors and informed of the results of the audit. It was determined that he had misappropriated funds to the sum of $67,000, as a result of which official proceedings will be instituted, and Bill is at this point disciplinarily dismissed from his job and told to pack up his belongings. The man does not admit this to his wife and for several days pretends to go out to the lab. When he returns home one afternoon, Nancy shows him some writing from the bank and asks where their money is disappearing to. Bill confesses that he's been fired from his job. His next question, are you having an affair, surprises him, but he answers yes, because something tells him he shouldn't lie anymore. Nancy starts to cry. Bill is suddenly overwhelmed with horror at the thought of the situation he has reached in life. He, an established scientist and father of three children, has embezzled the university's funds because of a prostitute lost his job and the respect of his colleagues, and is about to lose his family as well. The couple have a serious conversation. Bill admits to an affair with a prostitute, but assures that he will put an end to it and that everything will change. The wife wants to save the family and agrees to give him a chance. Nancy resigns from her job. She can afford to do so because Bill's university, as it soon turns out, can't fire him from his job, and certainly not overnight, because with the indefinite contract the professor has, it's quite a complicated matter, despite the charges against him. Bill and Nancy are now spending a lot of time together and feel like they are rediscovering their relationship. Everything is therefore, it seems, on a very good track. Bill is indeed not seeing Robin. She also does not seek contact with him. After all, 
she knows that her former sponsor no longer has money. The situation changes when a few months later, in February 1983, Bill is offered a job at a university in New York. A congress is held there beforehand, to which the professor is also invited. Bill then calls Robin and offers her to go with him. The congress will last one day, and Robin is to receive $1,000 for the trip. So Bill renews an old acquaintance, despite the weeks of work he has put into rebuilding his marriage. To top it off, the man extends the trip to three days, assuming, for reasons unknown, that Robin will settle for a one-day fee. When, on their return to Boston, the couple says goodbye, and the woman demands $3,000 and insists on that amount, Bill is apparently so shocked that he gets weak. It looks like a heart attack, especially as the man falls down and grabs his heart. Robin calls an ambulance, and the professor is taken to the hospital. Doctors have diagnosed not a heart attack, but a panic attack. But the hospital notifies Nancy. She inquires about the details, and it comes to light who called the ambulance. The wife thus already knows that Bill has not kept his word. This is a huge blow to her. But the woman decides to hold off on making decisions. For the time being, the spouses simply do not talk to each other. It is March 8th when Sam, Robin's boyfriend, reports his girlfriend missing to the police in Boston. He explains that he has not been able to contact her or find her anywhere for three days. Robin is listed as a prostitute, and the cops recognize Sam as her pimp. So they refuse to accept the report, explaining that the woman has probably run away, obliterating all traces behind her. When the missing woman's family joins in and gets the media involved, the police take action. Then it turns out that on March 6th, an unemployed man who was searching through trash pails along a highway near Boston found a bag with suspicious contents in one of them. There was a blood-stained woman's jacket and a man's shirt, as well as a hammer. Also with bloodstains, the man reported it to the police, who secured the find. Investigators connect the two cases and determine that the jacket belongs to the missing Robin Benedict. In addition, the policemen already know from Sam who Robin has been seeing recently. They pay particular attention to one of the men. It's Bill Douglas, a scientist employed at Tufts University. Sam insists that the professor didn't want to get unstuck from his girlfriend. When questioned, Bill admits that Robin visited him on March 5th but claims that she only informed him of the breakup and he accepted it. It then occurs to one of the investigators to check that the men's shirt that was in the bag, along with the jacket, is not Bill's property. The shirt has a hand-mended pocket, so, it seems, there will be no problems with recognition. It turns out that this idea is a hit. Nancy immediately confirms that it's her husband's shirt, which she recently mended herself, Later that day, Bill is arrested. During a search of his home, police find Robin's purse, which contains her credit cards and driver's license, and a notebook belonging to her with addresses. In the closet lies Bill's jacket, soiled with some substance. It looks so suspicious that the jacket is turned over for examination. The professor doesn't confess to the crime, and the police are unable to find the missing woman's body. But soon it can be considered certain that Robin is dead, as the lab detects the presence of a brain substance on the jacket. The lack of a body continues to be a problem, as it is unclear whether the prosecution will succeed in obtaining a conviction. The family is very determined to find the body and be able to bury Robin with dignity, so the two sides decide on a plea bargain. In exchange for the promise of a lower sentence, Bill promises to confess to the crime and point out where the corpse was hidden. The man then testifies that when Robin came to him on March 5th and started a fight, demanding $3,000, which he did not have. He was just alone at home, but she announced that she would repeat the visit and disregard other household members. A tug of war began. An enraged Bill grabbed a hammer and hit Robin three times very hard on the head with it. One of the blows proved fatal. The man wrapped the body in a quilt 
and put it in the trunk of her car. He threw the jacket, shirt, and hammer into a waste container by the highway. There was a bigger problem with the body. Bill drove around the neighborhood for a long time, thinking how to get rid of it. He eventually drove to Providence, about a hundred kilometers away, and dumped the package in a container at the mall. The police repeatedly searched the central garbage dump, where the contents of the mall containers go. Unfortunately, it is not possible to determine with sufficient accuracy where the container used at the time was emptied. William Douglas receives a sentence of 18 to 20 years in prison with the possibility of parole, but Robin's body was never found. Nancy files for divorce. In 1987, while still in prison, Bill marries 43-year-old Bonnie Jean Smith. The professor is released from prison, having served only 8.5 years of his sentence. In 1990, Benedict's family members meet with him to learn more about the case and possibly find the body. Bill does not provide any new relevant information on the case. The family's $29.5 million lawsuit filed against Douglas has still not been successful. And that's it for today. Goodbye and stay safe.